Am I on? I think I am, yeah? All right. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Alexander Burke, and I'm going to talk about uh, procedural meshes in Unity. This is actually the second time I'm giving this talk at Unite. I gave it at uh, Unite Europe about half a year ago. So what you guys are getting is actually the supersized US edition with more GIFs and um, a picture of John Travolta as well. So buckle up. <laughs> uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I am originally from Denmark, but have lived uh, three years in the UK. So if you have a hard time placing my accent, uh, that's why. And uh, I've been working in games for about, oh yeah, I don't know, five, six years. And I have done a lot of uh, different things. Um, a recent thing I've done is to create my own studio called Out of Bounds Games. And this year I had my first title released on PlayStation Vita, Steam, and soon, hopefully, on PlayStation 4. And sort of like my secret source in my game is to do procedural meshes. So um, that's why I know it's a really powerful technique. And um, I guess it's because I've always been a very like, visually driven developer. I guess we've all learned to program this way, at least uh, I did. And it was always sort of like, well, I could get to understand the basic concepts, but it was not something that motivated me a lot. It was a lot better when I started to actually like, do game development, but even that, uh, has its limitations because you are uh, like limited by the pre-made assets you already have, like the audio files and the textures and so on. Um, and what my ex my personal experience when it comes to using procedural meshes is that like what you're doing, you can it basically becomes like clay that you can like either sculpt more freely at um, like pre-run time or while you're running the game. And it gives you a lot more like, freedom to do what you want to do. The like, drawback is that it's not clay. It's, it's made out of like, uh, numbers and math, so you need to have a fa fairly good understanding of it. Um, but when you grasp that, you gain a lot more power to do exactly what you want to do. So this is the agenda for the talk today. Uh, I'm going to start out by uh, first like, giving some example of like, why, why do you want to like, do procedural meshes. Then I'm going to cover uh, basic, uh, the basics of how to do it uh, in Unity. Uh, then it's sort of like uh, it's a segment where I'm going to brag a bit of some of the stuff I've used them for. And I am going to end up with some like, hidden gems on optimization and debugging that uh, I had to dig really deep on, uh, on the internet to find or had to discover on my own. Um, as I said earlier, you really need to understand maths in order to like, get the full out of this talks, talk. So if you don't, I can recommend this book. It's one of the few um, like books I bought while I was at university, which wasn't like wasting my time. It's super condensed, and it covers a huge uh, area of uh, mathematics, like vector math, rotation, like uh, representation random number generation, splines, it's got it all. It's a really good, uh, good read. Furthermore, um, most of the, uh, the stuff I show you in the basic uh, section is actually from a series of examples I've written. Uh, Unity already have their own procedural examples, but they're from Unity 3, so they're kind of old, and they also they suffer from the problem that they're trying to be shiny and show you the potential but also trying to teach you how they work at the same time, whereas my examples are really basic, but very easy to understand. And there's also a port of something called triangle.net, which is um, something I've used in uh, my recent title myself. So why use procedural meshes? Well, I see three different use cases for it. The first one is like, uh, player-made content, like Spore is a really good example. Like You wouldn't be able to get that like blobby uh, like putting different uh, limbs together look that that game has without actually generating the, the mesh from scratch. Another case is if you want to do like unique mechanics, uh, which is something I use them for a lot. And I think Gish, which is sort of like 
oh, pre-indie indie. Like I think it's from 2007 or 8. Um, and you control this like blob of goo that can either be sticky or heavy or slippery or like a combination of them. And um, you wouldn't like be able to get that gameplay of, of trying to like control this blob without actually like generating the shape of it uh, dynamically. Uh, third, which has been really popular recently, is procedural generation actually like generating a, like a level uh, for the player to walk around in. And a really cool example, which I don't think a lot of people know about, is uh, Sir, you're being hunted, which is a it's a, it's a survival game where you're being hunted by robots that treat you like they, it's fox hunting. Uh, and they have an English countryside generator. So every time you play the game, it's like a new countryside. Uh, it's very quirky. I, I recommend checking it out. Of course, there's also Tilt Brush, which is, I, I think it's amazing. Like, you wouldn't be, like, without procedural meshes, you wouldn't be able to generate something like this and provide this like kind of interaction for the player. Um, yeah, I think it's probably one of the coolest things I've seen made with Unity in a long while. All right, so let's go over the basics. Um, and I'm starting really, <laughs> like really basic here. Uh, a mesh is made out of points called vertices that are then combined into triangles that can be rendered by the GPU. So that means that the most basic thing you need is a list of vertices and a list of uh, the triangles, like how those dots are connected. Depending on how you want your surface to look, you might need more information per vertex. Um, but that, I'm going to cover that as well. So in Unity, the most basic things you need in order to like, show a mesh and also to generate it is you need a mesh filter which is what stores your mesh. And then you also need a um, mesh renderer or like a um, skin mesh renderer or something equivalent in order to um, render it. And of course, you also need a script. It doesn't have to be attached to the, like, the game object where you're doing, like where the mesh is actually being uh, displayed. But uh, in the examples I provide, it is because it's the easiest. So this is probably the simplest mesh you can make. Um, the way you do it is first you create a, an object of the mesh class. Then you uh, give it a vertex array. And as you can see, it's just a vector freeze. And after that, you tell it like where in the vertex array like a given triangle is. So for this example, it's, it's, it's fairly basic. It can get complicated really quickly. Ooh, there we go. So um, if you want your surface to actually like, uh, like react to lighting, uh, it needs to know like, in what, uh, like, like what like direction it's facing. And you use normals for that. And it's basically uh, another vector that is pointing um, in the normal direction of the surface. Um, so as you can see here, we again have the same triangle from before on the left. Um, but both because it doesn't have normals and because I'm using a, um, uh, colored material with, that doesn't take, take lighting information. It doesn't actually react to the uh, directional lights zooming around while the triangle on the right does. Something that is not used that often in, um, like the, the way that you would like you used to like color models back in the day is, is that you would put uh, color directly on the vertices and then like you would interpolate from that. Um, Nowadays, you do that more with textures, but if you're doing stuff procedurally, I find it's really handy to be able to put in extra uh, information in the color channel. And if you're doing something like a particle system, it's still useful to actually have color come from the vertices as well. Um, in this example, I am basically every update changing the, the colors based on uh, HS, the HSV color space. So that's why you can see it's basically like rotating around. And normally, it wouldn't like have that banding effect. It's just because it's, it's in a GIF. Um, it's also worth noting that you can de define colors in two different ways. You can do it as floats, and you can also do it as uh, bytes. And in general, it's better to use bytes because you, um, you don't incur a conversion. Um, but for completeness, I'm showing you both. But this is the preferred way to do it. 
UVs uh, is basically a set of uh, 2D coordinates for each vertex. And what they're most commonly used for is to like, look up into a texture uh, and like, wrap this texture around the three-dimensional object. Um, and they can also be used for a bunch of other things if you need to pass in like, more information. And you, as you can see, it's again, it's quite simple. You create an, a vector two array, fill it with the information, and you then assign it to the, to the mesh, mesh object. Um, in this example, I'm actually also creating like an animated texture, but you can see that in the example project. So I'm, I've given like triangle, like setting triangle indices its own um, segment because it is what I have found to be like the, like the toughest not, not to crack in a lot of uh, cases. And it's predominantly down to the fact that your code executes in a linear manner, but you're trying to connect things in on a surface, so at least on uh, on a, like a, a 2D surface. But maybe you might even have something where it's it's a bit more involved than that. Um, you can just see like that's this is the code for just a simple plane, and what you have to do is like go along like one uh, line in the plane and actually reach over to the next row in order to get the indice for that. So you add in the, the width of the plane. And then you need to get the one in front of that. So that's plus one to that. And then you also have to do it for the other triangle um, that's in that like sub quad, um, sub rectangle. And um, this is just a simple example. It can get quite a lot more complicated, such as this. <laughs> this is um, a fog of war system for a um, like 4x game that was supposed to be on uh, mobile, so we had to make this system super optimized. And um, like my solution to that was to use a, a procedural mesh, but I, I had to like create the triangulation for this, and it's basically like hexes w within hexes. Um, how the heck do you like triangulate that? Well, what I did was I took some some paper and basically like drew it out, and. I started to like find like common features, like how does the topology, how does the mesh, uh, like the, con the connections actually repeat? And I found out that these like lines going through it would like be of like would be similar. And then I basically created like functions that would be like triangulate from A to B and 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 so on. Um, and if if you are, like, I, I think just actually draw, drawing it out on paper and like like looking at it is in general way easier than trying to like first just generate the vertices and then like print out where they are and so on. Just draw it, it works. So this is some of the stuff I have used uh, procedural meshes for in the past. Um, this is, uh, was an entry for Global Game Jam a couple of years ago where I, th I think the theme was um, we don't perceive the world uh, as it is, we perceive it as we are. So we got this idea of basically having a game where you change your perception of the world from being like flat to round, and you uh, you use that to like uh, solve puzzles. And that's actually done with um, like a procedural mesh. Um, so changing a, a mesh collider. Um, yeah, I guess this is actually like pre two D physics. It's it's kind of an old <laughs> old game here. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's cheating a lot, like as, as soon as it's doing the bending animation, it's actually not doing any physics, it's basically just like disabling it and then translating it uh, manually around. Uh, and then I basically, for the level being flat, I, I store like how the collider should look like and how, when it's uh, completely uh, round, how, how that should be as well. And then I enable and disable them at the start and end of, of a transition. The way that it's, it's actually doing the transition is that I have these two uh, uh, Bezier curves, which acts as the, um, like the unit vectors of the space, but I'm curving them, uh, and I'm then using the like, x, x, y position to basically get like a, a radian, uh, like a radial uh, coordinate like in degrees and in like distance away from the sensor in order to find out where it should end up um, when it's done the wrapping. 
you can't actually represent a circle with two bezels. It's uh, it's going to be a little bit out of. Uh, it's not perfectly round. So what I do for the last like five percent of the transition is uh, I basically uh, like slurp directly like um, directly to like the mathematically correct position. Um, but I still get like this nice effect of of the world uh, bending. So. This is the current game I'm working on, and um, it's called Laser Disco Defenders. It is a disco-themed, self-inflicted bullet hell shooter. And what that basically means is that the core mechanic is that every like, shot fired by the player stays in the level and keeps bouncing around. So the more trigger happy you are, the harder the, the game gets. Um, and for me, it was, uh, like, it was important that it was like, as fluid as possible. So, uh, in order to uh, get the lasers to, um, to render, uh, that's actually one giant mesh uh, as well. And a given beam is consisting of the middle end and the end caps that are like rounded. Um, if the beam is too short to have like a middle segment, it's, it's just like the two uh, start points that are like uh, generated. And uh, in general, it's uh, like instead of I could have like every time it hits uh, it hits a wall, trying to calculate exactly like how it should then um, like where, where the vertices meet meet up. But instead, um, I actually just draw like a big flare and hide that I'm being lazy. And it also happens to um, be good because then I can do like a, a circle um, check, uh, collision check, and see if I'm hitting something, which makes the games a, a little bit easier to play when you have to hit uh, enemies. Um, so yeah, sometimes it's just the best to actually be a bit lazy. And we have Johnny. So like, I did a lot of research into like, disco and the visuals and so on. And something that became quite apparent is that like, like, you need good lighting, and you need a lot of it in order to create that like, dance floor disco feel. Um, as you can see here, like each laser beam actually like, um, gives off light into the environment. Uh, I did have the problem, though, that I had promised my publisher that we were going to do a Vita release. So I had to optimize this quite a lot. So I couldn't rely on Unity's deferred lighting because it's just too slow for, um, like, like, yeah, I'd say low-end uh, mobile. I'm not sure you would con uh, categorize the Vita as that, but it, it doesn't have enough resources to do the third lighting and also uh, have like bloom and some um, uh, color correction uh, post-processing. And that's something I wanted as well because it gave like the game the right like disco look. So what I actually uh, ended up doing is that the light is also a mesh and it's pretty much the same mesh as it is for the lasers. It's just been like drawn out, uh, expanded and it's using a, a much more like diffuse texture. Uh, and like you can also have like uh, individual light sources. So it's basically just a component I add onto something. And it will also like tell the lighting system like, hey, you need to, make, to like draw a, a quad for me. And this is the colors uh, of, the, of this light and um, the radius. Um, that is then rendered into a texture by a, a, a camera that is like always uh, taking the same position and like size from the, the main rendering camera. But this camera renders first. And it's actually, because I'm not concerned about uh, like specular lighting, I only wanted like diffuse light, I actually found out I could reduce the size of this texture to only be 10% of, um, of the size of, uh, of like the actual like screen size, uh, which meant that I had a lot of like it was it, it didn't use a lot of like fill rate, which meant that I had like more uh, available for the post processing effects I wanted to, to run. Um, it's probably also why you can see it's a bit like uh, low resolution. And um, if you're like Neil here and you're like oh that that what like where can I learn more about this? I have actually uh, put. Um, a blog post up where I go more into detail on uh, like how, how I made the system and uh, how it works. And you can find that in, uh, on my own personal website. I'm also going like, to tweet out the slides where there's like, uh, a link to it, to it directly. 
It's also how I usually react to bugs, by the way. So procedural generation is something that I also think is, is really interesting to work with. So when I got the chance of like working on my own game full time, that's something I wanted to explore. And I wanted to make something that was also not just like tile based because that's been done before. Um, and as you can see, these are like the three zones in LaserDisco Defenders. There's like Crystal Cave, which has this like really nice faceted look. There's uh, the Dance Den, which is like more of the traditional blocky, blocky look. And then there's uh, the Groovy Grotto, which is like inspired by uh, lava lamps where everything is like curvy and, um, and blobby. And uh, it's actually all run through the same system. It's just like how I generate the outline um, and like the, the contour texture or like the contour, contour mesh that, that, that differs. But it does um, um, prove a bit of a challenge to again get to the triangles, um, as I mentioned earlier. So the way that the system works is that I basically have a set of uh, rules of like pre-made layouts and for a given difficulty setting, um, like if say you have survived until cave 10, then I take like how far you've gotten and I use that to grab like rules that are proving that that, that meets up with the, like the current difficulty you need to face, and then it basically just starts to like place them out and make sure they don't overlap, and then it generates like an outline for each of them, and in the next stage they actually all combine together into one like continuous outline, and um, then the last step is to triangulate it. And how do you do that? Like this is like, it, it changes so much from each like level, like how it's actually laid out. Uh, I do have some ideas for how I could do it, but I ended up being lazy and used uh, something called Delaunay triangulation. It's a method that was originally created for uh, taking like a point cloud of, of data and like create uh, triangles like connecting them with triangles so you could run like certain kinds of physics simulations on it in like in academia. Um, turns out it also works really well for this. And uh, it has fairly good like performance characteristics if you use the correct type of algorithm. I um, like I can maybe generate 50 levels a second on, on the Vita with the current situation. So like it's basically as soon as you complete a level, there's a new level for you to play. Um, so it's fast enough for my purposes. And um, I've basically taken and like ported an existing like C Sharp implementation uh, to Unity. It, like the port was to basically replace all the like double values with floats, but um, hey, I did a port. <laughs> and debugging and optimization. Like again, it's super important to like work visually I find like you can you can try and like debug your mesh by like just printing out the values it's tough um, I wouldn't recommend it uh, a much better option is to use something like the gizmos and debug class to draw draw out stuff as you're creating it and um, you also have like the like the, the thing you're gonna like um, have the most problems with is going to be like like you're generating your triangles and you might actually have triangulated your mesh correctly but they're turning the wrong way so quite often just turning your camera around and see if the triangle appears is, is, is a really good option and you can also turn on uh, wireframe rendering to see if the, the triangles uh, turn up um, so yeah so you have a bunch of um, like way of optimizing meshes that doesn't actually move while the game is, is running. Ironically enough, mesh.optimize does absolutely nothing. Uh, and I have this confirmed from Unity themselves. Uh, yeah, it used to do stuff, now it doesn't. So you can call that as much as you want. Um, so much better options is to either, like it, when you mark uh, a mesh uh, as like being static inside Unity, what it actually does in the background is that it takes all the static meshes and combine them into one giant mesh, and then based on where your camera is looking, 
it's it's basically gen like generating a, like in a triangle index uh, array to like figure out what it should actually render out. Um, you can do the same at runtime. So say you are you're, you're like creating a lot of prefabs um, or like spawning a lot of prefabs, then you can call static batching utility and actually like ask Unity to do the same like process that it would normally do just as you're like saving the scene or like editing the scene. Um, I do find like I have this is what this is some of the stuff I got a lot of questions about um, uh, back when I did the talk at Unite Europe and I didn't actually I hadn't had the need to research it myself. I've done a little bit of like uh, I've, I've created some example scenes uh, for you to look at and I did find that static batching utility will bring you like your draw call count down but it is not as good as if you actually like combine your meshes, combine the meshes yourself, which is the second option. It is a lot more work to do that though, and you risk breaking stuff, uh, especially if you have, like, if you do create like a, an automated process. Um, like what U Unity is basically trying to do with the static batching is like it doesn't want to like send an object for rendering if it's behind you, because then you have instead of like doing frost from calling, you end up doing like uh, like calling the triangles on the GPU, which is, is not efficient. Uh, and you can easily like make that mistake yourself um, when you're like combining the meshes. So dynamic meshes, the um, like the only option you have from Unity side is to say that the mesh is a uh, is marked as dynamic, and that basically tells the underlying graphics API that it's it's gonna like I need to change this every frame. So uh, try and like give me a, a memory buffer where like it's it's more easily accessible for that. Uh, this is one of those things that is not documented, and um, even the guys at Unity doesn't like some of them. They don't like I couldn't get an answer for like why this actually works, but. I saw like a f like five FPS frame rate in increase when I like started to double buffer my my meshes. Um, my best guess is that it's basically not, not re releasing the like the like the, the memory buffers in the background quickly enough for like every time like you are, you like keep using the same mesh object every frame. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, the only thing I know is that it works. <laughs> Um, yes, so if you can, the best like data structure to store your mesh data in is in flat arrays uh, because that is what it's actually reading uh, itself. But of course, if you don't know exactly like as you're creating the like before you start creating the mesh, like how much, uh, how many vertices uh, and UVs and so on you actually need, uh, I find it's a, a lot easier to just use the list and. Um, Unity actually provides like a set of functions where you can pass in a list directly uh, instead of having to do a conversion to an array. So that can also give you a quite nice performance boost. Of course, like if you're doing, um, like the less work you're actually doing, the better. Uh, and I like. I started with a very like naive implementation of my lasers where I would actually like render all the lasers uh, in the whole level and I found out like I, I can actually just like do a really simple like frostrum call myself um, both for like if the la if the laser should be drawn but also if the light for it should be drawn as well and as you can see that gives me like that doubles my performance uh, in this example which is um, was very nice. Oh, what did I write here? Yeah, this is sort of uh, like a, a beautiful hack. Um, and I haven't done it myself, but again, in the slide notes, there's a link to an article that describes it. You can actually create something, uh, like create a, a skinned mesh yourself and then move the bones for it and Unity will take care of moving the meshes for you. Of course, that it's, that's only good for something which is like actually something that is like riggable, but um, it can. It's, it seems like it can give like a, a really like nice performance uh, increase as well. And this is something I I did experiment with, 
and uh, failed horribly at actually getting to work. Uh, Unity's API isn't thread safe. Like you can't just like access the, the mesh object uh, from like a thread you create yourself. But if you're creating like the like you are creating like the uh, like the data going into it beforehand, so you might not actually have to worry about that. And I think like they just announced uh, the job queue system here at uh, at United LA. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read more into it, but I think that sounds like a really interesting uh, thing that we, we are now getting, getting access to. And just to give you an example of like how much like performance you can probably get out of it, like um, this is a profiling example from Laser Disco Defenders. And what you see to start with is basically all the lasers being like calculated where they actually are. And then the next thing is where they're being um, being rendered out and like, like, actually that's not exactly true. What happens is that it's first doing the, uh, the like physics calculations and then it's also drawing the laser, uh, like the mesh for the lasers itself. And then it ends up doing the, the lighting calculations. But the thing is, as soon as like a laser is done being calculated, like it, it has like moved or maybe it has like been reflected on a wall or it's hit something, it doesn't interact with any of the other lasers. So at that point, I could actually pass it on to like some worker threads and have them generate like the, the vertex data uh, for me. And like even if they are not put into like the exact same order in the, the array, it shouldn't, it still doesn't actually have a, like it shouldn't be a problem. Like the, all the lasers are completely independent from each other. Another option it's, is uh, compute shaders, which, which is um, basically a way of generating data on the GPU. Um, problem is, it's not available on, on all platforms. Like, it has to be something like fairly modern. Um, if you want to do some of these techniques on mobile, I, for example, I wouldn't recommend relying on compute shaders because it's still, there's still a lot of devices out there that doesn't support it. If you're only doing like console and PC, it might be worth looking into. Um, and the good thing is that Unity does like help you. You don't have to like write a compute shader for each like platform you want to target. You can like write it in one language, and Unity will compile it down to the rest. So that's really nice. All right. I have a lot of time left. I hope you have a lot of questions. <laughs> All right. So. Um, in summary, I hope I have um, given you uh, a good idea of like the power of what you can actually achieve with procedural meshes. Like it's something that you can use to solve like existing problems in a novel way, and it's also something that will allow you to create like gameplay and like rendering solutions that you wouldn't otherwise uh, be able to achieve. And it's something that has really like helped me um, create like unique solutions and unique uh, um, a unique look to my game. So I hope that's something that um, you can use yourself and I'm looking forward to see what you will use it for. Thank you. So I have really poor eyesight, so I hope there will be someone from Unity who can like help me fi figure out who has like uh, hands raised. Yeah, maybe. Sorry. Oh, all right. <laughs> so, do we have any questions? So, uh, about the skinning one, have you looked at how much more efficient the Unity skinning is versus just computing the mesh from scratch? Like, how much penalty do you pay for procedural meshes versus skinning? It's a good question, and I must admit I have, don't actually know. Um, I do think that article mentions that he ended up doing it this way because it was quicker. So, if, like, and it does kind of like make sense because you're pa I think you're passing way less data to the to the GPU. Like that's that's another problem with like dynamic uh, created meshes is that you ha you will probably hit like uh, the, like a bandwidth barrier, like how many how much data you can actually send over to the GPU. That's why that like frustrum calling 
uh, trick I showed earlier works so well. Because it both saves you in like, the calculations that you need to do, but also the amount of data you have to send over. So I think that's one of the reasons why it's, it's more efficient. Thank you for the lesson. Uh, uh, I'm interested in baking ambient occlusion and curvature maps into vertex colors. So uh, how would I get the vertices in crevices and in the sharp edges? Would it be possible? Sorry, could you try and repeat your question? Uh, so I, I would like to uh, bake ambient occlusion and uh, curvature maps uh, into uh, vertex colors. You okay. So how would I get the, uh, the vertices of the mesh, which, I've been, which I have modeled it earlier? earlier. Oh, uh, okay. That's super easy to do. Um, I thought you were like, going to ask me how to like, get that data into the mesh. Uh, yeah, okay. I've, I've never heard about a curvature map before. <laughs> uh, what you would do is basically say um, you would get like, the mesh filter component and then you would get the mesh from that. So it's also like, it's the same way that you also access ex existing meshes and, and change them. Okay, uh, and uh, I meant about uh, like when there's a, a vertice in, in a corner. So how would I recognize uh, with the, uh, 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 in the code that the vertice is in the Ah, uh, okay, so you mean like, uh, yeah, I guess yeah, that's for the ambient exactly. occlusion, isn't exactly. it? What? I guess that's for the ambient occlusion, like you need that yeah, information, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Um, do you have to, like, is this something you want to, like, have run really fast, or is it okay if it's slow? Like, the, can, is it like a baking process you want to do yourself, or? Yeah, yeah, the baking. I would like to do it uh, uh, in Unity and really fast with the code. Right. I don't, I don't want to paint, paint uh, uh, separate vertices in, in right. 3D modeling. But it's something right. that would be like your workflow, not something that would like run while the game is, is, is like played by the player, right? Yeah, my workflow. Yeah, okay. Well, in that case, you could use like, um, uh, like the indices array and actually try and do a lookup to like, uh, like connect it, uh, um, like basically find out like what triangles are this vertex part of and use that to calculate the angles and then see like if it's, uh, if it's narrow enough to like need the ambient occlusion. Okay, I will check that out. Uh, could I maybe contact you later via your blog or something to maybe uh, get the uh, proper answer through that? All right, sure. Yeah, thanks. Hey, thanks for the talk. It's pretty good. Um, <laughs> thanks. I'm I'm kind of curious. You talked a lot about rendering, but um, how does how does the physics system deal with like changing collision meshes potentially if you're generating something like that? Yeah. So I, I guess the best example is um, don't, 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 don't. like this. So like. I am, I'm cheating. I'm cheating so much. Like, I basically have two di like, versions of the collision mesh, and when I'm doing the translation, I just disable physics completely and just do the interpolation. Um, changing a mesh collider at runtime is really expensive. Um, I did like, an, like another, uh, even earlier game, where I actually created like, a destructible environment, and that was all done with mesh colliders. And I actually found out um, like a little dirty trick. I'm not sure it still works. It probably does that instead of like actually sending in like new mesh data, I, I would just change like the, um, uh, the indices array. And then where something was destroyed, I would create like a degenerate triangle. And it was way quicker than like trying to actually like rebuild the rest of the mesh. Uh, so if you want something where you're like taking stuff away or adding stuff in, that can be quite quick. Um, especially if you actually start to use like sub, uh, like splitting up your, like this was like a, a worms game on, on a planet. Um, so I basically had like a curve for the whole planet and then I would like generate the mesh around it. But it would actually be a lot of like small separate mesh colliders, which for like runtime performance wasn't very good, but for changing the individual, like for changing the actual like um, collider, that turned out to be a lot quicker. Um, so, in like, I think there's like, um, it's, um, uh, it's not like um, a linear uh, 
like calculation in order to actually generate like in the new collision uh, mesh when you set in, send in like new data. It seems to be like uh, to the power of two or three or something. Uh, so if you can keep like the, uh, the, colli the collision mesh small, you can actually do those changes really quickly. And, it's, and if you still need, need like a large me uh, collision mes mesh, try and like split it up into smaller ones and then do the change. Uh, did that answer your question? Do we have any more? Um, yeah? What do you think are the best? I know you covered this to some extent, but what are the best learning resources? Uh, there isn't, well, I, I guess like Unity's own procedural examples and the scripting reference was got me started on it. Uh, for me, it was just a lot of like tri trial and error and like, like try and like see what I could do and what would like break. Um, like that thing with like, for example, like the planet and like, like splitting it up into smaller chunks was just something I found out myself by, by experimenting with it and sort of seeing like, oh, the bigger the mesh is, even like there, there's like an, an, a non-linear correlation there. That's something like I, I basically found out on my own. Um, I, I, like I have learned a bit of like OpenGL in the past. I guess that also helps. Um, and uh, that's actually an, another thing why that like math book I talked about earlier is so good because it actually has a, a section on shader programming and it does a better job of explaining shader programming than my OpenGL book from, from university did. Um, so like, yeah, get that book. <laughs> that's that's my, uh, my advice. I guess one thing that I would add is that the, uh, the um, Sir, You Are Being Hunted game that you mentioned earlier on, um, from Big Robot Games, they actually did a talk about their approach to the entire thing, uh, which I believe is available on the Unity uh, YouTube channel as well. Um, so if you type in Big Robot or Sir, You're Being Hunted in the YouTube channel, there's a, there's a whole thing about their, their approach to it. And I guess slightly different, uh, slightly different approach, slightly different type of game as well. So yeah, good place yeah. to have a look. I think like my experience has been with a lot of like 2D content, as you can see. Uh, if you need something, like, um, like, so you're being haunted is a, is a 3D game. So if, if you're more interested in that, maybe, maybe that talk is uh, is a good place to start. Yeah, definitely. I think so. Yeah. All right. Thanks for your time. Thanks.